Education After Auschwitz by Theodore Adorno. A working document. The inability to identify with others was unquestionably the most important psychological condition for the fact that something like Auschwitz could have occurred in the midst of more or less civilized and innocent people. What is called below what is called fellow traveling was primarily business interest. One pursues one's own advantage before all else, and simply not to endanger oneself does not talk too much. That is a general law of the status quo. The silence under the terror was only its consequence. The coldness of the societal monad, the isolated competitor, was the precondition, as indifference to the fate of others, for the fact that only very few people reacted. The torturers know this, and they put it to test ever anew. One must come to know the mechanisms that render people capable of such deeds, must reveal these mechanisms to them, and strive by awakening a general awareness of those mechanisms to prevent people from becoming so again. It is not the victims who are guilty, not even in the sophistic and caricatured sense in which still today many like to construe it. Only those who unreflectingly vented their hate and aggression upon them are guilty. One must labor against this lack of reflection, must dissuade people from striking outward without reflecting upon themselves. The only education that has any sense at all is an education toward critical reflection or critical self-reflection. But since according to the findings of depth, Psychology, all personalities, even those who commit atrocities in later life, are formed in early childhood. Education seeking to prevent the rep repetition must concentrate upon early childhood. Science here has one of its most relevant tasks. <clears throat> the premier demand upon all education is that Auschwitz not happen again. Its priority before any other requirement is such that I believe I need not and should not justify it. I cannot understand why it has been given so little concern until now. To, just, to justify it would be monstrous in the face of the monstrosity that took place. Yet the fact that one is so barely conscious of this demand and the questions it raises shows that the monstrosity has not penetrated people's minds deeply itself a symptom of the continuing potential for its reoccurrence, as far as people's conscious and unconscious is concerned. Every debate about the ideals of education is trivial and inco inconsequ inconsequential compared to this single ideal, never again Auschwitz. It was the barbarism all education strives against. One speaks of the threat of a relapse into barbarism, but it is not a threat. Auschwitz was this relapse, and barbarism continues as long as the fundamental conditions that favored that relapse continue largely unchanged. That is the whole horror. The societal pressure still bears down, although the danger remains invisible nowadays. It drives people toward the unspeakable, which culminated on a world historical scale in Auschwitz. Among the insights of Freud that truly extend even into culture and sociology, one of the most profound seems to me to be that civilization itself produces anti-civilization and increasingly reinforces it. His writings, Civilization and Its Discontents, and Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego deserve the widest possible diffusion, especially in connection with Auschwitz. If barbarism itself is inscribed within the principle of civilization, then there is something desperate in the attempt to rise up against it. Any reflection on the means to prevent the recurrence of Auschwitz is darkened by the thought that this desperation must be made conscious to people, lest they give way to idealistic platitudes. Nevertheless, the attempt must be made, even in the face of the fact that the fundamental structure of society, and thereby its members who have made it so, are the same today as 25 years ago. Millions of innocent people, to quote or haggle over the numbers as already inhumane, were systematically murdered. That cannot be dismissed by any living person as a superficial phenomenon, as an aberration of the course of history to be disregarded when compared to the great dynamic of progress, of enlightenment, 
of the supposed growth of humanitarianism. The fact that it happened is itself the expression of an extremely powerful societal tendency. Here I would like to refer to a fact that, very characteristically, seems to be hardly known in Germany, although it furnished the material for a bestseller like The Forty Days of Musa Deg by Werfel. Already in the First World War, the Turks, the so-called Young Turk Movement, under the leadership of Enver Pasha and Talat Pasha, murdered well over a million Armenians. The highest German military and government authorities apparently were aware of this, but kept it strictly secret. Genocide has its roots in this resurrection of aggressive nationalism that has developed in many countries since the end of the 19th century. Furthermore, one cannot dismiss the thought that the invention of the atomic bomb, which can obliterate hundreds of thousands of people, literally in one blow, belongs in the same historical context as genocide. The rapid population growth of today is called a population explosion. It seems as though historical destiny responded by readying counter-explosions, the killing of whole populations. This only to intimate, intimate how much the forces against which one must act are those of the course of world history. Since the possibility of changing the objective, namely societal and political conditions is extremely limited today, attempts to work against the repetition of Auschwitz are necessarily restricted to the, to the subjective dimension. By this, I also mean essentially the psychology of people who do such things. I do not believe it would help much to appeal to eternal values at which the very people who are prone to commit such atrocities would merely shrug their shoulders. I also do not believe that enlightenment about the positive qualities possessed by persecuted minorities would be of much use. The roots must be sought in the persecutors, not in the victims who are murdered under the paltriest of pretenses. What is necessary is what I once, in this respect, called the turn to the subject. One must come to know the mechanisms that render people capable of such deeds, must reveal these mechanisms to them, and strive by awakening a general awareness of those mechanisms to prevent people from becoming so again. It is not the victims who are guilty, not even in the sophistic and caricatured sense in which still today many like to construe it. Only those who unreflectingly vented their hate and aggression upon them are guilty. One must labor against this lack of reflection, must dissuade people from striking outward without reflecting upon themselves. The only education that has any sense at all is an education toward critical self-reflection. But since according to the findings of depth psychology, all personalities, even those who commit atrocities in later life, are formed in early childhood, education seeking to prevent the repetition must concentrate upon early childhood. I mentioned Freud's thesis on discontent in culture, yet the phenomenon extends even further than he understood it above all because the pressure of civilization he had observed has in the meantime, mul meantime multiplied to an unbearable degree. At the same time, the explosive tendencies he first drew attention to have assumed a violence he could hardly have foreseen. The discontent in culture, however, also has its social dimension, which Freud did not overlook, though he did not explore it concretely. One can speak of the claustrophobia of humanity in the administered world, of a feeling of being incarcerated in a thoroughly societalized, closely woven, net-like environment. The denser the weave, the more one wants to escape it, whereas it is precisely its close weave that prevents any escape. This intensifies the fury against civilization. The revolt against it is violent and irrational. A pattern that has been confirmed throughout the entire history of persecutions is that the fury against the weak chooses for its target, especially those who are perceived as societally weak and at the same time, either rightly or wrongly, as happy. Sociologically, I would even endure or even, fuck, I would even venture to add that our society, while it integrates itself ever more, at the same time incubates tendencies toward disintegration. Lying just beneath the surface of an ordered, civilized life these tendencies have progressed to an extreme degree. The pressure exerted by the prevailing universal upon everything particular, upon the individual people and the individual institutions, 
has a tendency to destroy the particular and the individual together with their power of resistance. With the loss of their identity and power of resistance, people also forfeit those qualities by virtue of which they are able to pit themselves against what at some moment might lure them again to commit atrocity. Perhaps they are hardly able to offer resistance when the established authorities once again give them the order, so long as it is in the name of some ideal in which they have or not at all believe. When I speak of education after Auschwitz then, I mean two areas. First, children's education, especially in early childhood, then general enlightenment that provides an intellectual, cultural, and social climate in which a recurrence would no longer be possible. A climate, therefore, in which the motives that led to the horror would become relatively conscious. Naturally, I cannot presume to sketch out the plan of such an education, even in rough outline. Yet I would like at least to indicate some of its nerve centers. Often, for instance, in America, the characteristic German trust in authority has been made responsible for National Socialism, and even for Auschwitz. I consider this explanation too superficial, although here, as in many other European countries, authoritarian behavior and blind authority persist much more tenaciously than one would gladly admit under the conditions of a formal democracy. Rather, one must accept that fascism and the terror it caused are connected with the fact that the old established authorities of the Kaiserreich decayed and were toppled, while the people psychologically were not yet ready for self-determination. They proved to be unequal to the freedom that fell into their laps. For this reason, the authoritarian structures then adopted that destructive and, if I may put, put it so, insane dimension they did not have earlier, or at any rate had not revealed. If one considers how visits of potentates who no longer have any real political function induce outbreaks of ecstasy in entire populations, then one has good reason to suspect that the authoritarian potential even now is much stronger than one thinks. I wish, however, to emphasize especially that the recurrence or non-recurrence of fascism in its decisive aspect is not a question of psychology, but of society. I speak so much of the psychological only because the other, more essential aspects lie so far out of reach of the influence of education, if not of the intervention of individuals altogether. Very often, well-meaning people who don't want it to happen again invoke the concept of bonds. According to them, the fact that people no longer had any bonds is responsible for what took place. In fact, the loss of authority, one of the conditions of the sadistic authoritarian horror, is connected with this state of affairs. To normal common sense, it is plausible to appeal to bonds that check the sadistic, destructive, and ruinous impulse with an emphatic, you must not. Nevertheless, I consider, consider it an illusion to think that the appeal to bonds, let alone the demand that everyone should again embrace social ties so that things will look up for the world and for people, would help in any serious way. One senses very quickly the untruth of bonds that are required only so that they produce a result, even if it, even if it be good, without the bonds being experienced by people as something substantial in themselves. It is surprising how swiftly even the most foolish and naive people react when it comes to detecting the weaknesses of their betters. The so-called bonds easily become either a re ready ba badge of shared convictions, one enters into them to prove oneself a good citizen, or they produce spiteful resentment, psychologically the opposite of the purpose for which they were drummed up. The amount to heteron- hetero fuck. The amount of heteronomy, <laughs> a dependence on rules, on norms that cannot be justified by the individual's own reason. What psychology calls the superego, the conscience, is replaced in the name of bonds by external, unbinding, and interchangeable authorities, as one could observe quite clearly in Germany after the collapse of the Third Reich. Yet the very willingness, willingness to connive with power and to submit outwardly to what is stronger under the guise of a norm, is the attitude of the tormentors that should not arise again. It is for this reason that the advocacy of bonds is so fatal. People who adopt them more or less voluntarily are placed under a kind of permanent compulsion to obey orders. The single genuine power standing against the principle of Auschwitz is autonomy, if I might use the Kantian expression, 
the power of reflection, of self-determination, of not cooperating. I once had a very shocking experience. While on a cruise on Lake Constance, I was reading a Baden newspaper, which carried a story about Sartre's play Mort's Saint-Sepulcre, a play that depicts the most terrifying things. Apparently, the play made the critic uneasy, but he did not explain this discontent as being caused by the horror of the subject matter, which is the horror of our world. Instead, he twisted it so that, in comparison with a position like that of Sartre, who engages himself with the horror, we could maintain, almost, almost maintain, I should say, an appreciation of the higher things, so that we could not acknowledge the senselessness of the horror. To the point, by means of noble existential cant, the critic wanted to avoid confronting the horror. Herein lies, not least of all, the danger that the horror might recur, that people refuse to let it draw near and indeed even rebuke anyone who merely speaks of it, as though the speaker, if he does not temper things, were the guilty one and not the perpetrators. With the problem of authority and barbarism, I cannot help thinking of an idea that for the most part is hardly taken into account. It comes up in an observation in the book, The SS State by Eugene Kogon, which contains central insights into the whole complex and which hasn't come near to being absorbed by science and educational theory the way it deserves to be. Kogan says that the tormentors of the concentration camp where he spent years were the most part young sons of farmers. The cultural difference between city and country, which still persists, is one of the conditions of the horror though certainly neither the sole nor the most important one. Any arrogance toward the rural populace is far from my intentions. I know that one cannot help having grown up in a city or a village. I note only that probably debarbarization has been less successful in the open country than anywhere else. Even television and the other mass media probably have not much changed the state <clears throat> of those who have not completely kept up with the culture. It seems to me more correct to say this and to work against it than to claim that one of the most important goals of education is the debarbarization of the countryside. This presupposes, however, a study of the conscious and unconscious of the population there. Above all, one must also consider the impact of modern mass media on a state of consciousness that has not yet come anywhere close to the state of bourgeois liberal culture of the 19th century. In order to change this state of consciousness, the normal primary school system, which has several problems in the rural environment, cannot suffice. I can envision a series of possibilities. One would be, I am improvising here, that television programs be planned with consideration of the nerve centers of this particular state of consciousness. Then I could imagine that something like mobile educational groups and convoys of volunteers could be formed who would drive into the countryside and in discussions, courses, and supplementary instruction attempt to fill the most menacing gaps. I am not ignoring the fact that such people would make themselves light only with great difficulty, but then a small, small circle of followers would form around them. And from there, the educational program could perhaps spread further. However, there should arise no misunderstanding that the archaic tendency toward violence is also found in urban centers especially in the larger ones. Regressive tendencies, that is, people with repressed sadistic traits, are produced everywhere today by the global evolution of society. Here, I'd like to recall the twisted and pathological relation to the body that Horkheimer and I described in the dialectic of enlightenment. Everywhere where it is mutilated, consciousness is reflected back upon the body and the sphere of the corporal in an unfree form that tends towards violence. One need only observe how, with a certain type of uneducated person, his language, above all when he feels faulted or reproached, becomes threatening, as if the linguistic gestures bespoke a physical violence barely kept under control. Here one must surely also study the role of sport, which has been insufficiently investigated by a critical social psychology. Sport is ambiguous. 
On the one hand, it can have an anti-barbaric and anti-sadistic effect by means of fair play, a spirit of chivalry, and consideration for the weak. On the other hand, in many of its varieties and practices, it can promote aggression, brutality, and sadism, above all in people who do not expose themselves to the exertion and discipline required by sports, but instead merely watch. That is, those who regularly shout from the sidelines. Such an ambiguity should be analyzed systematically to the extent that education can, education can exert an influence. The results should be applied to the life of sport. All this is more or less connected with the old authoritarian structure, with modes of behavior, I could almost say, of the good old authoritarian personality. But what Auschwitz produced, the characteristic personality types of the word world of Auschwitz, presumably represents something new. On the one hand, those personality types epitomize the blind identification with the collective. On the other hand, they are fashioned in order to mani manipulate masses, collectives, as Himmler, Haas, and Eichmann did. I think the most important way to confront the danger of a recurrence is to work against the brute predominance of all collectives, to intensify the resistance to it by concentrating on the problem of collectivization. That is not, an, that is not as abstract as it sounds in view of the passion with which especially young and progressively minded people desire to integrate themselves into something or other. One could start with the suffering the collective first inflicts upon all the individuals it accepts. One is only to think of one's own first experiences in school. One must fight against the type of folkways, initiation rites of all shapes, that inflict physical pain, often unbearable pain, upon a person as the price that must be paid in order to consider oneself a member, one of the collective. The evil of customs such as the Run, Run Act and the Haberfeldtreiben and whatever else such long-rooted practices might be called is a direct anticipation of National Socialist acts of violence. It is no coincidence that the Nazis glorified and cultivated such monstrosities in the name of customs. Science here has one of its most relevant tasks. It could vigorously redirect the tendencies of folk studies that were enthusiastically appropriated by the Nazis in order to prevent the survival, at once brutal and ghostly, of these folk pleasures. This entire sphere is animated by an alleged, alleged ideal that also plays a considerable role in the traditional education, the ideal of being hard. This ideal can also ignominiously, fuck, I hate this word. This ideal can also ignominiously enough invoke a remark of Nietzsche, although he truly meant something else. I remember how the dreadful Boger during the Auschwitz trial had an outburst that culminated in a panegyric to addition or to education instilling discipline through hardness. He thought hardness necessary to produce what he considered to be the correct type of person. This educational ideal of hardness in which many may believe without reflecting about it is utterly wrong. The idea that virility consists in the maximum degree of endurance long ago became a screen image for masochism that, as psychology has demonstrated, aligns itself all too easily with sadism. Being hard, the vaunted quality education should inculcate, means absolute indifference toward pain as such. In this, the distinction between, one, between one's own pain and that of another is not so stringently maintained. Whoever is hard with himself earns the right to be hard with others as well and avenges himself for the pain whose manifestations he was not allowed to show and had to repress. This mechanism must be made conscious just as an education must be promoted that no longer sets a premium on pain and the ability to endure pain. In other words, education must take seriously an idea in no wise unfamiliar to philosophy, that anxiety must not be repressed. When anxiety is not repressed, when one permits oneself to have, in fact, all the anxiety that this reality warrants, then precisely by doing that, much of the destructive effect of unconscious and displaced anxiety will probably disappear.
People who blindly slot themselves into the collective already make themselves into something like inert material, extinguish themselves as self-determined beings. With this comes the willingness to treat others as an amorphous mass. I call those who behave in this way the manipulative character and the authoritarian personality. Indeed, at a time when the diary of Haas or the recordings of Eichmann were not yet known. My descriptions of the manipulative character date back to the last years of the Second World War. Sometimes social psychology and sociology are able to construct concepts that only later are empirically verified. The manipulative character, as anyone can confirm in the sources available about those Nazi leaders, is distinguished by a rage for organization by the inability to have any immediate human experiences at all, by a certain lack of emotion, by an overvalued realism. At any cost, he wants to conduct supposed, even if delusional, real politic. He does not for one second think or wish that the world were any different than it is. He is obsessed by the desire of doing things, indifferent to the, count, uh, to the content of such action. He makes a cult of action, activity, of so-called efficiency as such, which reappears in the advertising image of the active person. If my observations do not deceive me, and if several sociological investigations permit generalization, then this type has become much more prevalent today than one would think. What at that time was exemplified in only a few Nazi monsters could be confirmed today in numerous people. For instance, in juvenile criminals, gang leaders, and the like about whom one reads in the newspapers every day. If I had to reduce this type of manipulative character to a formula, perhaps one should not do it, but it could also contribute to understanding, then it would call it the type of reified consciousness. People of such a nature have, as it were, assimilated themselves to things, and then, when possible, they assimilate others to things. This is conveyed very precisely in the expression, to finish off just as popular in the world of juvenile rowdies as in the world of the Nazis. This expression defines people as finished or prepared things in a doubled sense. According to the insight of Max Horkheimer, torture is a manipulated and somewhat accelerated adaptation of people to collectives. There is something of this in the spirit of the age, though it is little to do with spirit. I merely cite the saying of Paul Valéry before the last war, that inhumanity has a great future. It is especially difficult to fight against it because those manipulative people who actually are incapable of true experience for that very reason manifest an unresponsiveness that associates them with certain mentally ill or psychotic characters, namely schizoids. In the attempt to, to prevent the repetition of Auschwitz, it seems essential to me, first of all, to gain some clarity about the conditions under which the manipulative character arises, and then, by altering, altering those conditions, to prevent, as far as possible, its emergence. I would like to make a concrete pro proposal <laughs> to study the guilty of Auschwitz with all the methods available to science, in particular with long-term psychoanalysis, in order, if possible, to discover how such a person develops. Those people would be able yet to do some good in contradiction to their own personality structure by making a contribution so that such things do not happen again. This could be done only if they would want to collaborate in the investigation of their own genesis. Certainly it will be difficult to induce them to speak. By no means should anything related to their own methods be employed in order to learn how they became what they are. In the meantime, however, in their collective, precisely in the feeling that they are all old Nazis together, they feel so secure that hardly any of them has shown the, le the least sentiment of guilt. Yet presumably there exist even in them, or at least in many, psychologically sensitive points conducive to changing this attitude. For instance, their narcissism, baldly put, their vanity. They might have a sense of importance if they could speak of themselves freely, like Eichmann, who apparently recorded whole libraries of tape. Finally, one can assume that even in these persons, if one digs deep enough, one will find vestiges of the old authority of conscience, which today frequently, frequently is in a, in a state of dissolution.
once we learn the external and internal conditions that make them what they are, if I may assume hypothetically that these conditions can in fact be brought forth, then it will be possible to draw practical consequences so that the horror will not happen again. Whether the attempt helps somewhat or not cannot be known before it is undertaken. I don't want to overestimate it. One must remember that individuals cannot be explained automatically by such conditions. Under similar conditions, some people develop in one way and other people completely differently. Nevertheless, it would be worth the effort. S simply posing such questions already contains a potential for enlightenment. For this disastrous state of conscious and unconscious thought includes the erroneous idea that one's own particular way of being, that one is just so and not otherwise, is nature, an, unal an unalterable given and not a historical evolution. I mentioned the concept of reified, reified consciousness. Above all, this is a consciousness blinded to all historical past, all, I, all insight into one's own condition, conditionedness, and posits as absolute what exists conting, contingently. If this coercive mechanism were once ruptured, then I think something would indeed be gained. Furthermore, in connection with reified consciousness, one should also observe closely the relationship to technology, and certainly not only within small groups. The relationship here is just as ambiguous as in sports, to which it is related, incidentally. On the one hand, each epoch produces those personalities, types varying according to their distribution of psychic energy. It needs societally. A world where technology occupies such a key position as it does nowadays produces technological people who are attuned to technology. This has its good reason. In their own narrow field, they will be less likely to be fooled, and that can also affect the overall situation. On the other hand, there is something exaggerated, irrational, pathogenic in the present-day relationship to technology. This is connected with the veil of technology. People are inclined to take technology to be the thing itself, as an end in itself, a force of its own, and they forget that it is an extension of human dexterity. The means and technology is the epitome of the means of self-preservation of the human species are fetishized because the because the ends, a life of human dignity, are concealed and removed from the consciousness of people. As long as one formulates this as generally as I just did, it should provide insight. But such a hypothesis is still, too, still much too abstract. It is by no means clear precisely how the fetishization, fetishization of technology establishes itself within the individual psychology of particular people or where the threshold lies between a rational relationship to technology and the overvaluation that finally leads to the point where one who cleverly devises a train system that brings the, the victims to Auschwitz as quickly and smoothly as possible forgets about what happens to them there. With this type who tends to fetishize technology, we are concerned, boldly put, with people who cannot love. This is not meant to be sentimental or moralistic, but rather describes a deficient libidinal relationship to other persons. Those people are thoroughly cold. Deep within themselves, they must deny the possibility of love, must withdraw their love from other people initially, before it can even unfold. And whatever of the ability to love somehow survives in them, they must expend on devices. Those prejudiced authoritarian characters whom we somehow survive or whom we examined at Berkeley in the authoritarian personality provided us with much proof of this. A test subject, the expression itself already comes from reified consciousness, said of himself, I like nice equipment. Completely indifferent about what equipment it was, his love was absorbed by things, machines as such. The alarming thing about this, alarming because it can seem so hopeless to combat it, is that this trend goes hand in hand with that of the entire civilization. To struggle, to struggle against it means as much as to stand against the world's spirit. But with this, I am only repeating what I mentioned at the outset as the darkest aspect of an education opposed to Auschwitz.
As I said, those people are cold in a specific way. Surely a few words about coldness in general are permitted. If coldness were not a fundamental trait of anthropology, that is, the constitution of people as they in fact exist in our society, if people were not profoundly indifferent toward whatever happens to everyone else, except for a few to whom they are closely bound, and, if possible, by tangible interests, then Auschwitz would not have been possible. People would not have accepted it. Society, in its present form, and no doubt as it has been for centuries already, is based not, as was ideologically assumed since Aristotle, on appeal, on attraction, but rather on the pursuit of one's own interests against the interests of everyone else. This is settled, settled into the character of people to their innermost center. What contradicts my observation, the herd drive of the so-called lonely crowd, is a reaction to this process, abandoned together of people completely cold, who cannot endure, endure their own coldness, and yet cannot change it. Every person today, without exception, feels too little loved, because every person cannot love enough. The inability to identify with others was unquestionably the most important psychological condition for the fact that something like Auschwitz could have occurred in the midst of more or less civilized and innocent people. What is called fellow traveling was primarily business interest. One pursues one's own advantage before all else, and simply not to endanger oneself does not talk too much. That is a general law of the status quo. The silence under the terror was only its consequence. The coldness of the societal monad, the isolated competitor, was the precondition as indifference to the fate of others for the fact that only very few people reacted. The torturers know this, and they put it to the test ever anew. Understand me correctly. I do not want to preach love. I consider it futile to preach it. No one has the right to preach it since the lack of love, as I have already said, is a lack belonging to all people without exception, as they exist today. To preach love already presupposes in those to whom one appeals a character structure different from the one that needs to be changed. For the people whom one should love are themselves such that they, that they cannot love, and therefore in turn are not at all that lovable. One of the greatest impulses of Christianity, not immediately identical with its dogma, was to eradicate the coldness that permeates everything. But this attempt failed, surely because it did not reach into the societal order that produces and reproduces that coldness. Probably that warmth among people, which everyone longs for, has never been present at all, except during short periods and in very small groups, perhaps even among peaceful savages. The much maligned utopians saw this. Thus, Charles Fourier defined attraction as something that first must be produced through a humane societal order. He also recognized that this condition would be possible only when the drives of people are no longer repressed, but fulfilled and released. If anything can help against coldness as the condition for disaster, then it is the insight into the conditions that determine it and the attempt to combat those conditions, initially in the domain of the individual. One might think that the less is denied to children, the better they are treated, the greater would be the chance of success. But here two illusions threaten. Children who have no idea of the cruelty and hardness of life are then truly exposed to barbarism when they must leave their protected environment. Above all, however, it is impossible to awaken warmth in the parents who are themselves products of this society and who bear its marks. The exhortation to give more warmth to children amounts to pumping out warmth artificially, thereby negating it. Moreover, love cannot be summoned in professionally mediated relations like that of teacher and student, doctor and patient, lawyer and client. Love is something immediate and in essence contradicts mediated relationships. The exhortation to love, even in its imperative form, that one should do it, is itself part of the ideology coldness perpetuates. It bears the compulsive, oppressive quality that counteracts the ability to love. The first thing, therefore, is to bring coldness to the consciousness of itself, of the reasons why it arose. In conclusion, permit me to say a few words about some possibilities for making conscious the general subjective mechanisms without which Auschwitz would hardly have been possible.
Knowledge of these mechanisms is necessary, as is knowledge of the stereotypical defense mechanisms that block such a consciousness. Whoever still says today that it did not happen or was not all that bad already defends what took place and unquestionably would be prepared to look on or join in if it happens again. Even if rational enlightenment, as psychology well knows, does not straight away eliminate the unconscious mechanisms, then it reinforces, at least in the preconscious, certain counter impulses and helps prepare a climate that does not favor the uttermost extreme. If the entire cultural consciousness really became permeated with the idea of the pathogenic character of the tendencies that came into their own at Auschwitz, then perhaps people would better control those tendencies. Furthermore, one should work to raise awareness about the possible displacement of what broke out in Auschwitz. Tomorrow, a group other than the Jews may come along, say the elderly, who indeed were still spared in the Third Reich, <clears throat> or the intellectuals, or simply deviant groups. As I indicated, the climate that most promotes such a resurrection is the revival of nationalism. It is so evil because in the age of international communication and supranational blocks, nationalism cannot really believe in itself anymore and must exaggerate itself to the extreme in order to persuade itself and others that it is still substantial. <clears throat> Concrete possibilities of resistance nonetheless must be shown. For instance, one should investigate the history of euthanasia murders, which in Germany, thanks to the resistance the program met, was not perpetrated to the full extent planned by the National Socialists. <clears throat> the resistance was limited to the group concerned. Precisely, this is a particularly conspicuous, very common symptom of the universal coldness. The coldness, however, on top of everything else, is narrow-minded in view of the insatiability that lies within the principle of the persecutions. Virtually anyone who does not belong directly to the persecuting group can be overtaken. <clears throat> there is thus a drastic egoistic interest that can be appealed to. Finally, inquiry must be made into the specific historically objective conditions of the persecutions. So-called national revival movements in an age in which nationalism is obsolete are obviously especially susceptible to sadistic practices. All political instruction finally should be centered upon the idea that Auschwitz should never happen again. This would be possible only when it devotes itself openly, without fear of offending any authorities, to this most important of problems. To do this, education must transform itself into sociology. That is, it must teach about the societal play of forces that operates beneath the surface of political forms. One must submit to critical treatment to provide just one model such a respectable concept as that of reason of state in placing the right of the state over that of its members. The horror is potentially already posited. Walter Benjamin asked me once in Paris during his emigration, when I was still returning to Germany sporadically, 